Hello everybody and welcome to our session today. This is the third of our webinar series on preparation for adulthood, um, which is being delivered by the Lancashire West Yorkshire Whole School Send team. So we're all with you here with you this evening and we've got some special guests who will also be sharing some of uh, their information with you as well. So if you've been at the previous sessions, thank you for joining us again. Um, if this is your first session, thank you very much for, for attending. We will be doing a bit of a recap on what we've covered in previous sessions. And we will also um, sort of signpost you to where you can go to see the first two webinars if you would like to catch up. So thank you. Next slide, please. So we are hoping that Blackpool Pro uh, Project Search will be joining us. And we also have Jenny Pemberton, who is from Hollymount Trust today. Just to remind you of our contract aims, we do share these with you in every webinar, so I won't read them out to you, but essentially we are providing the DfE's workforce contract for SEND. And our ambition and our aim is to develop everybody and improve their practice and skills in relation to working with children and young people with special educational needs and in also to support them and their families. Um, one of the things that we are very keen to do is to sort of improve people's understanding of preparation for adulthood, because it is something that we feel within the region is very much misunderstood. And I think Nicole captured it the other day when we were talking about this, and she said, really, preparation for adulthood is all that we do all of the time, because actually that's what education should be all about. It is about preparing young people for adulthood. So all send is actually about preparing young people with SEND to have better lives in the future. Next slide, please. So our presenters, um, as, as mentioned before, we are in green, the Lancashire West Yorkshire team. So myself, I'm CEO of a multi-academy trust, the Seaview Trust, which is a fully inclusive trust with a range of schools. Um, I'm also the regional leader for Lancashire and West Yorkshire, and I'm a national leader of education. Uh, with me, I have Nicole Dempsey. Nicole, would you like to just introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Nicole Dempsey. I'm Deputy Regional Send Lead for Lancashire and West Yorkshire. Um, and in my day job, I'm the Send and Safeguarding Lead for Dixon's Academies Trust, uh, which is mainstream um, schools across Bradford, Leeds, Manchester and Liverpool. And I also have uh, Helen Howe. Hi, I'm Helen Howe. I am a serving Senko in a mainstream secondary school in Southport. And I'm also the deputy safeguarding lead and a member of our team. Thank you. We've got uh, Francesca Wakefield with us from Whole School Send. Francesca's role is to make sure things run as smoothly as possible. Uh, if you're having any kind of technical issues, then just pop a note in the chat and Francesca, who is amazing, will be able to support you and put things right for you. Um, and then we have also got Jenny Pemberton with us uh, this evening. So Jenny's the clinical lead for speech and language therapy at Hollybank Trust. And um, she, just to explain what Hollybank Trust is really, it's a specialist provision working with children, adults and young people with very profound disabilities. So she's a fantastic asset for us this evening because she's going to be able to sort of really specialise that PFA offer for you. But what we would like you to remember is there are children and young people in mainstream who also have quite complex needs. So we want to make sure that, you know, people are able to translate some of the information we share in this session on the specialist offer and recognise that there will be children in mainstream because parents have choice and they can choose where they would like their young person to go to school. So there will be schools where you will have children with quite complex needs. And we want to make sure that you feel well equipped to meet those needs as we go through the training. And finally, we have Project Search. Unfortunately, they're having some technical issues joining us at the moment, but we are hoping that by the time we get to their input, we will have resolved those things. But don't worry, we will manage a way around it if they aren't able to join us, and we'll hopefully still give you a flavour of that really powerful and effective work that they're doing, uh, and it's Project Search in Blackpool that we've been particularly working with. Next slide, please. 
So just to share with you the session objectives, it is about the introduction of PFA at that very specialist level. We're going to be giving you sector examples. And then hopefully, if we have time at the end, we're just going to try to use the audit tool we've been introducing through the sessions to try to capture where we're up to. Um, and obviously, as we said before, the specialist offer is about learners with more complex needs and how they could access a PFA offer. Over to you, Helen. Uh, OK, thank you. So I think if we go on to the next slide, I think what we do just to start with uh, is just recap, obviously, the first two sessions uh, that we've had very much uh, about kind of setting the scene. Now, if you remember, uh, we had Barry Jones talk, joining us from the NDTI, who did some fantastic work with us about getting us to think about the importance of PFA, getting us all to think about what a good life is. He obviously did also with us was our What Matters Island. And that was a kind of a nice set in the scene for us in those kind of very early sessions. We also went through and picked through with you kind of what the four main areas of PFA were. So just to recap on that, they were employment, good health, independent living uh, and community inclusion, which obviously involves friendships and relationships kind of of young people. Again, kind of did a lot of groundwork for kind of setting the scene and trying to put the importance kind of of PFA um, in our settings. So we looked at some of the available statistics and the labour market information um, in to, to see why PFA is important for our 0 to 25 age range. Uh, and also looking at some of the concerning data that was coming through for that. Now, Nicole's going to recap on a bit of that in just a second and go over again that disability perception gap. But again, I think those kind of initial sessions there, it was quite you know, clear to see kind of why good, strong PFA needs to be put throughout kind of all the ages. Uh, we then talked about the other pupil voice, kind of how that was important in helping us kind of put the PFA through. Uh, and then also looked at how we put PFA into the different levels uh, and different sectors, the universal, the target and the specialist, which I'll just speak through in just a second. Uh, and, and generally kind of spoke through as well as how uh, most of us don't realise that we also already have a lot of PFA kind of within our settings. And then we did a couple of gap tasks to ask you to kind of think about those things and think about what you already have in place. OK, then, so if we just go on to the next slide, kind of please. OK, so what, what we wanted you to do is to think about, and this is how we kind of put our sessions across, uh, is PFA at the three levels of support, at the universal provision, the targeted provision and the specialist provision. And obviously what we've tried to do is we've tried to split our actual sessions into these kind of three areas. So our first session laid a lot of the groundwork, as I said, of the importance of PFA and looking at PFA at a universal level. Our last session was looking at PFA at the targeted level. And obviously today's session is looking at PFA from that specialist kind of perspective there. So just to break down again, then what those kind of different levels equate to and what they mean, if we just go on to the next slide, please. Uh, so, yeah, uh, so the universal provision uh, was the whole school provision of where we kind of PFA comes into the whole school. And this is the point that we were trying to say in our first kind of session that there's an awful lot of that would already be existing kind of that you do in your school. So getting you to kind of think about and target that. And again, as a secondary SENCO, kind of we were discussing in particular kind of, that you know, in your kind of curriculum itself, there are a lot of subjects that lend them, themselves to PFA. The last session, we then moved over to targeted provision uh, and we're talking about how the targeted provision that is additional and different to what we do kind of for the, for the whole school population. Okay, How we could kind of look at putting PFA into our targeted provision and again, looking at the primary, the secondary uh, and the higher education. So today our focus is having covered 
the actual universal and the targeted previously, we're going to focus today kind of on specialist provision. Okay, and in particular, obviously, some of our speakers today we're going to give some fantastic kind of examples of that. And when we talk about special provision, okay, what we're actually talking about then is educational provision that's designed specifically to meet those highly personalised needs kind of of our children, particularly those uh, with EHCPs. OK, so I'm going to pass over to Nicole now and she's going to just explain a little bit more about that and talk about that uh, disability perception gap. Thank you. So this diagram that's on the screen at the moment is just a different way of visualising the triangle diagram from the previous slides, but particularly useful in thinking about how that universal targeted specialist relationship changes over time and how um, the more you can incorporate into your main offer, your universal offer, uh, the easier it is, but also there are other benefits as well, which I'll talk about when we go on to the next couple of slides. Obviously, in this session, we're talking specifically about that most specialist offer. And there are really two ways that you can think about that. These diagrams can be really easily applied to a, to a mainstream school or they're usually associated with mainstream schools where you've got the main of what you do, your additional and different for your SEND support children, and then something quite bespoke and specialist for your children that have EHCPs. Um, but actually this same diagram applies to any setting, including a resource provision within a mainstream and to uh, more specialist provisions where there will still be a main offer. There will still be things that children get that are more unique to them or children with similar needs. And there will also be things that are unique to individual children. And the same process applies. The more they can be included in the main alongside the high quality bespoke provision that they need, uh, the more they're getting access to other skills and other experiences that really support um, preparation for adulthood. And it's, it's really about getting that balance right for those highest need children. Next slide, please. In the previous sessions, the very first session, we talked in a lot, we spoke in a lot more detail about the disability perception gap and, and different things around that. Um, I've, the link's on the screen, so when you get the PowerPoint, you'll be able to go look at it yourself. Um, or to go back to the original one if you want more, the first session if you want more information about that. But just to recap, that being part of that main offer exposes children to experiences that the, they don't necessarily get through provision that separates mainstream from special or from uh, within a school higher need children from children that are not SEN or that are more able than them by some measures um, and that means that they're not necessarily developing the skills and the confidence and the sense of self that is associated with that and I'm not going to go into details we don't have any of the bar charts and things that come with it but the research that Scope did into um, people's perception of disability really starkly shows the impact of that with the majority of the adult population drastically underestimating how many disabled people there are in society possibly probably not solely but possibly because when they were in school children with disabilities and differences were not necessarily in the classes with them so they've got a warped perception of what proportion of society that is and it also really starkly impacts on people's attitudes towards disability with the perception that disabled people get in the way um, timesing by five amongst people that do not know anyone with a disability so aside from um, developing the life skills and um, confidence and self-perception that all of our children need to be successful happy adults whatever success looks like for them an appropriate happy adulthood to their needs um, we also have a role in school to make sure that we address um, this disability perception gap and make sure that children have a positive experience of learning and thriving in a diverse community and again that applies to whether it's a mainstream or a specialist setting um, but can be particularly vulnerable in mainstream settings that have an alternative provision or a resource base where where there is that separation and that might be right for the children some of the time even most of the time but it's about being conscious of it and making sure that we work to address that as well next slide another aspect of that kind of intertwined interrelated with that 
is this idea of the hidden curriculum and we have things that we directly teach the children the curriculum and the targets from the EHCP and so on and we also have things that we're knowingly teaching them alongside that through our behaviour policies and um, PFA and, and things similar to that but Another layer on top of that is what the children learn just from seeing our behaviour towards each other, how we talk to them, how we talk about them, how we arrange our classrooms, how we talk about um, the different intervention and provision that might be happening. That is also drip feeding them a message about their value, the value of other people and how they all relate to each other. So within um, any setting, alongside these things that we're doing knowingly it's about being self-aware about how our choice of language or how we choose to organize a task is also delivering a message to the children about the value of them as an individual their peers um, diversity and difference and making sure that we we're delivering a positive message through our actions and our example next slide going to remind people of the four themes of PFA. So essentially their employment, securing good health, supporting independence and independent living, and making sure that we support friends, relationships and community. And over the last two sessions, we've filled and populated that little sort of pie chart with so, uh, ideas from mainstream sort of provision of how we might be delivering that PFA offer. So again, if you want to look back on the previous webinar, you can actually have a look and see how we've sort of suggested you could do that. What we're going to do today is give some really good sector examples of good practice. So we're not going to focus on this as much, but we're going to allow you to sort of think about those four areas. And as you hear sort of our uh, speakers actually sort of create your own little grid of the specialist sort of advice and information you're getting and where you think that needs to sit. So next slide, please. This is just to remind you of the four broad areas of need. Obviously, as we move into more specialist provision, the greater the need, more children with more need, and often the sort of complexity of need, this multiple and overlappingness of need is much more apparent. So quite typically, as we move into the sort of specialist realm, we will have children who will have sensory and physical needs sort of comorbid with uh, additional needs in maybe the area of communication interaction and quite a severe cognition and learning need. Indeed, you have children who probably have needs falling in all four boxes. So they're sort of welded into the middle of that grid. But it's just helpful to have those things there to remind yourself, because in, in designing your specialist PFA offer, you might want to think about what it is you're putting in there that might be particularly useful for children with particular needs. Next slide, please. And so now I'm delighted that uh, Rachel Baldwin from Project Search in Blackpool has been able to join us in spite of technical issues. So thank you so much, Rachel, for, for coming to join us today. Um, I, I, the schools in my trust are in Rosendale in Lancashire, and then uh, our other schools are over in Blackpool. And I know that Park Community Academy, who is one of our special schools, works very closely with Project Search and speaks very highly of them. So Rachel, uh, over to you, and I think we have your slides ready. Thank you. Thank you, Angela, thank you. Um, can, be, can you hear me okay, Angela? Yes, yes, that's great, thank you. I, I put myself in a small room, so it's very echoey, you see, so I wasn't sure how um, it would sound on, on Zoom. So yeah, apologies for that. I don't know what's going on with the connection, but anyway, I'm here now. <laughs> So um, I'm just going to talk to everyone briefly and an overview about Project Research, uh, which is a supported internship programme which is facilitated um, and hosted by Blackpool Council. Okay. Um, do I do the slides or do you do the slides? I will do the slides if you just tell us which slide you want. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yep, so the, our, our main mission and our aim is to try to secure competitive employment within Blackpool and the community with people um, age 16, 24, um, who have a learning dis difficulty and are on the autism spectrum. Next slide, please. 
So I'm sure um, a lot of you are aware, um, over 65% of adults with a learning disability want to work, but only 6% known to the local authority in England are actually in paid work. Uh, this can be through multiple reasons, but this is why we're here and we're going well now for, for eight years as a sports internship programme to open up the doors for our young people to show them what they can do rather than what they can't do. So um, this is something that we're fighting against on a yearly basis. And next slide, please. So these are just a few um, pictures of our um, young people that have been through the programme. So like I say, we started in 2014. Um, so we may recognise a few two people, if you, if you can see them, that is. Um, every year is a different year, individuals are coming in and um, although I've been doing it for eight years, it was a pilot that first started with Blackpool Council um, and we didn't know how successful it was going to be. Um, I'm pleased to say that you know more and more people are knowing about Project Search and the success of the outcomes that we, we do have, but sometimes I went to um, an event yesterday for um, preparing for adulthood and even some people on the table didn't know who we were still, which is quite um, shocking in some respects, but you know it, it just tells me that we need to do more about raising awareness that we are here and we are an option for people that do have a passion to try and get unemployment. Um, some good faces there. <laughs> Next slide, thank you. So yeah, so we are a support internship program. So the team consists currently of myself as a job coach, uh, another colleague who's a job coach. We've just recruited another one, so you can see how it's, it's evolved over the other years. We've got bigger. Um, so we've got a bit, a bit a wider team now and we also have a tutor. Um, we're looking for people and young people aged between 16 and 24. One of our criteria is we do have a criteria checklist and one of our main um, part of that category is that they do want to want to work. Um, and I know sometimes young people don't actually know what they want to do in the future. Um, but if that's the case, you know, we'll, we'll happily come to any school, mainstream, special schools, um, Let's be large, but we'll be, like, as you say, we work very closely with yourselves um, and we'll do talks. We like to bring interns with us as well so that they can tell them about their journey. Um, as you can see, I'm very passionate about what I do, but sometimes it's better to hear it from the actual person who's been through the programme, whether they've been successful getting a job or not. Um, they've completed the course and they've graduated, so that's a massive achievement in itself. Um, we do maximum take 12 for some reason for the last sort of seven years uh, even through um with the covid and pandemic we we, we take 10 to 12 interns on uh, any more than that and i think we would lose the sort of quality and, and the sort of person-centered approach because it's quite an intense program and that's all that, that's the reason why the numbers are sort of stuck around 10 to 12 interns okay um, job coaches, so you know, we support them in the workplace. So I think some a bit more unique to some other programs um, is because we have the job coaches and, and myself being one of them, we go into the workplace and we go into the employers, we, we do all the talk, we do all that. It's a bit like a sales pitch, really. Um, you shouldn't have to do that, but unfortunately, we, we do to, to tell them sort of about what our young people can achieve and how enthusiastic and eager they are. And because we learn the role as well, a lot of employers like that. They like to be able to uh, have a link with us and to, 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 to offer like staff training as well to, to people in employers. For instance, for example, um, we've just got Sea Life on this year and quite a bit younger team. Um, I've never worked with people with learning difficulties before and they found it quite hard. And so sort of, actually one of our guys made it a work cry because um, they um, didn't know how to, to, to speak to one of our young people because he's very, very structured and very routine and on the autumn spectrum. So when they changed his timetable, when we didn't know about it, 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 kind, of, it kind of blew up and, and, and got a bit upset about it all. But we came in and we would, um, we, we spoke about them and about our young person and we did a bit of a Q and A with them. So it overcame those barriers. So that's, that's, that's one reason why we have job coaches in the workplace as well. To, to advocate for our young people. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, yeah, like I said, so we've, yeah, as I mentioned, we do learn the role first. We, we do a very um, sort of robust systematic instruction for our young person to be able to learn the job description. So my role is to, to gather all the information and then break down and adapt to suit the needs of that young person. Um, 
Before they go into the workplace, we do a very um, fun um, tea building um, induction in September. So we get to know our young person. Um, it's very important that they get to know us. Uh, we get to know them because I can't help or coach somebody without knowing like the triggers and what they like, what they don't like. You know, it, it's, it's a very sort of intense sort of relationship we have with a young person, especially when we're working with them Monday to Friday. Um, they're going out meeting new people, social skills, you know, all, all that taking to place. And as you know, everyone's different. So some might like to be working in a small team, big team. All these questions get asked at the start so we can identify where they feel most comfortable at and where they feel that they'd like to excel in skills for employability. Um, next slide, please. So a typical day, um, every day is a different day, as I'm sure we all know working in this sector uh, with, with young people. Um, so normally we're based here at Becky Staff House, which is next door to Sainsbury's in the uh, centre of town. Um, we start at nine, the class starts at nine o'clock. Um, we're very, very hot on the timekeeping and uh, commitment from a young person. Um, and in that class, it's it's more about, like when we talk about maths, it's not doing an exam or doing a test. It's it's about um, learning about wages, about budgeting, uh, and to like salaries and, 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 and to, to doing like spreadsheets and data inputting, something that we can relate to a workplace or, or a job or a skill that, that will help them on through future on through the journey of project search. We do then um, support or coach traveling to the workplace. Now, we've had quite a few interns that come to us that are not independent travelers. We will um, support that throughout the summer. So we're in the midst now of our recruiting for our year nine cohort. So we identify who does require um, some assistance with traveling. Um, and again, that's done very uh, at a pace where they are able to um, understand and some might be happy to get on a bus, some might not have done it before, might have had school transport or whatever means they have getting to and from school. So we sit down with the family, sit down with the young person and we, and we put a plan together as to how we can help and support that person. Um, some people, even coming onto project search, they might not get a job, but if they can be an independent traveller by the end of the course, that's a massive life skill in itself, you know, and the confidence that you can um, see in that young person is, is very rewarding and makes it all worthwhile. Um, every year we have about three or four interns that do need our support and that for me is, is, is a massive, massive achievement for that young person. And um, so they go to the workplace, we then um, have a buddy or a manager one or two buddies in case that person on your, on your leave or is on a different job or whatever so we, we, we place them up with someone who's we know um, are supportive and um, are sort of like the, the creme de la creme that one of the best workers if, 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 if so to speak just so when they're working alongside them they're getting the right sort of coaching the, the right sort of mentoring because once on your person grasps that job role, if they learn to have cut corners, say, or people doing some different organisations, not saying we all do, <laughs> but you know, if, if we've got somebody who's uh, sort of like cut corners, then our young person will learn it that way as well. So we do, we do sort of stress that we do need people to show us, the coaches and our young person, the best of the highest standard of their um, workforce. So they're, they're embedded and immersed into the workplace until three o'clock, and then they come back to us um, to Bicker Staff House and um, to feedback about how their day's been. Um, we've had it many times where um, people come back to us and, and they've had a good day and, and, and do like a, um, a daily feedback chart and they go home happy. If they didn't do that, we know in one year we actually had them going straight home um, and it didn't work because they were going home and they had issues in the workplace and parents, carers didn't know what or who to talk to about it as such. So, the, the structure is, is, is like that, that type of day does work and, and it's actually proven to work for us to be at the start and at the end and it works for the employers. Um, so thank you. Next slide please, Angela. So this is a sort of like overview of how Project Search runs. So rotation one will start in September. So well, that, that isn't the first time we meet the young person. We meet them throughout the summer. So we've, we've already met some potential candidates for September spot dates. And over the summer, we'll do home visits, albeit we're allowed in the home, COVID restrictions and things. Um, or we'll meet in the park. We get to know the young person throughout the summer so that when they come to September, it's, it's not as alarming or as you know as startling as it can be when you start something new. Um, 
like I said, we have a two-week induction, so we go to the zoo, we might go to the sea life, two swords, we might go to Blackpool Transport, to the Ruby Road, all different areas that we can sort of get our group together so that they can start getting to know one another in a work, in a professional setting. So rotation one is, is in September to December. Then after Christmas, we go into rotation two, uh, which we're currently in now. This seems to have like a very long rotation. <laughs> I don't know, it seems like a very long time till East Day still. Um, but I know, I know young people, that they, they do seem to have a bit of a lull after Christmas. They sort of get a bit like, Oof, you know, it, it was exciting new at the start and now it's like everyday work, work, work. But what they don't understand is that they're building their stamina up, they're building their credibility and, and you know, the, the, the focus is, is, is at the end is about getting a job or being competitive in the market. And they, they, know, they don't know what they're doing daily is actually adding to that CV, adding to their, to their, their skills and qualities throughout the whole rotation too. So um, it's, it's very important rotation too, to, to you sort of see the ones that are there, the standard and the ones that really want it. Um, coming up to rotation three after Easter, so this is where we are asking parents, we're asking the intern and also ourselves as a team to be looking for jobs out there in Blackpool. It's a very hard time at the moment, as everyone can imagine, um, but there are jobs there and our guys um, are, have worked so hard and what we try and do for Rotation 3 is, is place them where we feel or have heard on the grapevine that there might be a job coming up in, in, for like maybe seasonal. We don't often go with that as priority number one, but we'll take anything to get a foot in the door. So Rotation 2, 3 is a, more about putting them sort of cleverly into a, a organisation or an employer where we feel like there might be more chance for the ones that have the potential of successful getting the job. As you can see there, we've, we've worked with many different organisations within Blackpool. The portfolio is just getting bigger and bigger, which is fantastic. I'm pleased to see we've got Blackpool Zoo on there. That's, a, that's been a tough one coming. That's the first time in, in seven years that we've been able to add that to our slides. So, um, that they are more than happy and we're going to actually have an intern starting after Easter working at the zoo. Um, Blackpool Coastal Housing is a relatively new one as well, um, construction. Uh, we've got to be mindful and realistic as well about what our young people are, are doing. We don't want to put them in places where they need higher qualifications to be qualified. As, um, and I think you can imagine the health and safety around construction and, and knocking down walls and tools and stuff. So we've got to be very careful and work very closely with Blackpool Coastal as to what our young people are going to achieve and um, and what we can do for them, vice versa. So that's something that we're just starting. Um, and Merlin Entertainment can, and Sea Life and Massachusetts have been a relatively new placement for us, but all gone very well, I'm pleased to say. Uh, we've just had talks with Bintros, um, the bar which used to be the Pizza Express place and so we'll, we'll hopefully just be working with them soon and also um, the best, best Western, the Great, Great Western, the Colton Hotel on, on the corner. So we are getting more and more employers on board which is, which is fantastic to say that the climate that we're in at the moment as well. So uh, next slide please. So these are some of our young, our young people. Um, so we've got, like I say, this is just to visually see what they're actually doing. They're, they're doing real jobs. The, the, the jobs aren't carved. They're not, they're not like um, taking the parts just, just so that they can do like the mundane jobs. They're doing actual roles. So um, we've got a sea life there, we've got man two so, so Lewis in the middle, he's just been offered a job actually already, um, even though we're not finished, quite finished our programme. Um, but he's going to start doing weekend work and we're going to concentrate working on his customer service skills. So he's done fantastic. So he's he's over the moon. So, he's, so but we'll carry on supporting them. Even if you get jobs, we don't just leave them. We'll continue to support them as and when the employer requires us to and the young person requires us to. Obviously, we don't support them as much as we do as, as we would do on the programme because that's not the point of it. The point is that they can stand on their own two feet and they become ownership of that role. Um, but we are there. Um, Hannah, also, I don't know if anyone else, Hannah, she, she's also got a job. She's got a job at Winter Gardens uh, in the kitchen. So she's going to be working um, four days a week starting after Easter. Again, we're going to support her. Uh, apparently, Winter Gardens have never seen the cleanest surfaces in the kitchen ever. So, and she's very methodical. Very, she doesn't like to talk too much, she doesn't like to talk to me which I find quite hard because I like to talk a lot. Um, but she, she, she brings quality to the team and the workforce, which they've never had before, and she gets the job done. 
So even though they might be lower on the social side of things, the actual the quality of the work is up there with everybody else to some degree. So you know these guys done done fantastic, and we're still obviously only in rotation two. So I'm hoping that more and more of our young people um, on the program get jobs. Um, so we've still got we still got till June, so we you know we've, we've, we've still got time. So I'm quite hopeful. Um, just next slide, please. So yeah, so benefits for our interns, obviously, you know, we, we're, we're there every step of the way. We, the moment they walked into the office with us in September to the, the moment they go into the graduation in June, the 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 confidence is oozing out of them. Again, not necessarily, you know, if they get a job or not. It's, sometimes it's just about being um, included, including in, in, a, in a team, about being, you know, with professional and they learn so many life skills. Um, it, it, the, the program just just does more than just employability. They bring a, a young people together who, who all want the same vision, job, whatever, how, how that's done, their own, their own pathways they'll take themselves. But it's about them you know, having the conversations about being mature, about you know, budgeting and, and, and money and, and having those, those people around you for the peer support is, is, is really good. The co-production that we have, you know, that they have every part of the way that they, they complete my journey presentation. So they're putting their twist on their journey and they have a say as to where they want to go. They have a say of how they want to present their presentation. So their voice is being heard again every step of the way, which is building up their resilience and the confidence. Um, so we get a lot of feedback from the parents as well about how the young person has, has changed, even in, even at home, about the conversations they're having about you know society and, and things like that. So it's, it's, it is a very um, unique program of project searches and I, and I, and I will I can talk about it to the, to the cows come home sort of thing so um, if I put you over to the next slide please so again employees I've touched on a couple of these already you know uh, they are overlooked so young people and um, a lot of people um, sometimes look at the disability rather than the ability of a young person so they have hidden talent pools and once you put them into a team and they're there for like 10 to 12 weeks they come out of the shelves and, and they show you what you can do so they are massively overlooked i think but that's why we have them in a, a placements for so long so they've got the time and the and, 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 the, and the, their, their pace to be able to show people what they can do they like a walking cv they like to see because you know, CVs can only tell you a snippet of what a person is, but when we do our rotations, this see the, the whole person, which, which is fantastic. It does, it boosts morale. Very, very rarely we get a young person in a, in a workplace where they're, where the, where the, the wind, you know, the, the moaning about life, they just, just get on with it. And, and they're quite bubbly young people because they, they, they enjoy being there. You know, we're not twisting their arms. We're not saying you have to be there. Um, they, 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 the demonstrating of, of, of who they are and they, they, it oozes out and it does change a lot of um, work placements and stuff. I know that um, we had Jake in the first year, he was, he was um, very much about buses, loved buses, knew the timetable better than Blackpool Transport knew the timetable. Um, and he 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 was helping young people, like old, old people, get to the to the bus stops because he knew where to go. And that wasn't asked of him; he just did that. Um, so you know, it does it, it, it gives a new diversity to a workforce. Um, just give a moment, just to, if everyone can read the few slides on that. Okay, next one, please. So some success stories. So this is so top right. We've got Ben. He was um, 16 when he came to us from Park Academy. Um, he's still currently um, there today, working 25 hours a week. Um, if you see him now, he's, he's like, a, and I don't mean to be different, but he's like a man. He's a man, man. He's like he's 16 when he came to us, and, and he's just so so big now, <laughs> like a like you know like a, like a big, big adult. I would call him, uh, but he, he loves his job, you know, and, and he's 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 been there from 2014, and he loves it. Um, and his, his parents never thought he would get a job in in the, in the council, and so they're they're, they're thrilled. We have um, Liam who works at the um, Medivest, which is a sister company to NHS. And he's been given awards for his customer service going above and beyond. As you can see, he got his job through um, through COVID and, and he was still one of the um, key workers and, he, and we managed to support him through that. So 
um, even though it's very trying times for the, for the worldwide, he still kept on and, and kept his job going. So he goes around the whole of the outside of the hospital, emptying the bins, making sure it's safe, um, doing all the litter picking. Um, and he absolutely loves it and is getting well known now within the uh, facility there. And then bottom right, we've got uh, Matthew, who, who started working at the football club in the catering, um, even pulls pints now. Hopefully he doesn't drink them the same, but he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a good young man. And, and that was our first placement with, with, with him. And they liked him that much, they wanted to keep him. So yeah, this is, this is, a, um, so this is just a snippet of what, what, what we're achieving now. So yeah, so I'm happy to, to, to tell anybody any more information. Um, I'm sure Angela will give you my, my details. Um, if anyone's got any young people that want to come on to this year's cohort, we do have a process um, interview and then we have a skills assessment day um, and then we have um, like a, a rubric which to make sure that we're the right for them and more importantly they're right for us because it is only a one year uh, funded course so if you came onto the course and then three months down the line the young person decided actually I'm not ready for it I want to come back next year unfortunately we can't we, only, we can only draw funding down for that one year you see so we do have to have quite an uh, quite a lengthy conversation and the process just to make sure that they are right for project search because we won't want them to start at 18 and actually wait say i'll go to college and then, then, then miss that boat if you know what i mean so we do have to make sure that they are right for, for us and vice versa um i think that's it really i don't know if there's anything else if anyone's got any questions i'm happy to ask or that's at the end i'm not sure hi hi rachel thank you thank you so much for that and it, it, your passion comes across uh, your enthusiasm for your young people and and it's so lovely because we've been building up to this specialist offer we started with the universal offer of you know what what we should be doing in all schools for all learners and then we moved into the targeted offer which is what we were doing that was additional to and different from that offer for everybody for some learners who have got some special educational needs and then tonight we're really focusing in on children with more need and and children who would maybe access specialist provision um you know and and um, we've got Jenny who's going to be, be following on from you telling us about very very specialist provision um but uh, we, we've had a a question in the chat from somebody uh, uh, about do you only take learners who are Blackpool residents um no, 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 no. We, we do, we do um, have a sort of cut-off point because obviously it's, it's Blackpool Land Council-based um, program, but we do have people from Lancashire County Council um, and uh, out of Borough. But the only, obviously, there has to be a cut-off point because obviously they have to travel to and from um, home to, to, the, to the classroom. There is another project search in Preston, and um, so we, we are sort of split now in the northwest. But so. Um, but yeah, we, ideally, definitely Blackpool Council, but we do take people from, from out of Borough as well. Rachel, would it be possible for you, for you to share with us so we can pass it on to people where the project searches are, you know, around the country? Yeah. Do you do you have a yeah. sort of list? Because I know that many local authorities have, you know, adopted project search. And it yes. certainly seems like a very robust programme and a really good way of getting young people, you know, into sustainable employment. And I think, you know, that that's the biggest challenge, isn't it? We've, we've always exactly. typically got them onto to sort of um, work experience placements, but they've tended to be short lived and only whilst they've had that support. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're having such impact in young people finishing the course and then actually, you know, sort of them being able to, to um, yes. sort of stay in that mm -hmm. role for years in some cases, which is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and, we, and we're still supporting some people from back in 2014, you know, because we a young man who came from High Furlong and um, he's, he's fantastic. He updates all of the computers. Um, it's above my head now what he does, but, you know, we, but we support him walking from municipal building to, to, to the, the council because he, he still struggles with the roads. So, you know, so we still have that link with him. Um, and just one more thing, what, what, what is, I, I didn't add that, if I may. Um, Obviously, we do for the criteria is the educational healthcare plan as one of the criteria. But we do also following from that, we do a one-page profile, um, which we, we pass out with, with the young person consent to, to employees as well. And that, we found that to work very well, just as an idea for, for people in schools that may be doing like two weeks experiences. If a one-page profile is, is quite to the point, and, and employees do quite like that. 
And I've got a question from Catherine uh, Ketter, which is, is Project Search a national programme so I could access one local to my learners in Mansfield? Yeah, it, the, the programmes up and down the country, is, it, it was first originated in America, in Cincinnati, in a children's hospital, it's worldwide. The, 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 the Project Search is all over the world, all over the globe. So um, I'll be happy to share um, any, anything that, I, I know um, Carmel McKill, McKill, who used to work as a um, Deputy Chief Executive of the Council, she's one that started with us in 2014, and she'll be the main contact to be able to put anybody in um, talks with people in the local borough if they want to find a project search call to them. So if, if we can get some, some details, we will yes. share them with people. And if, if people want to contact us through the usual sort of, uh, I think it's on our, our information is also on the um, yeah. end of the slideshow. So you can contact us or really helpfully, Rachel's put her contact details on there. So if people have got yeah. follow up questions they'd like to particularly put to, to Rachel. I mean, you know, you've been amazing at responding to my strange queries, Rachel. So <laughs> I, I can give testament to the fact that you're very good at responding back to people oh, yes. and you know what's going on. So thank you so much. Um, okay. You know, I think it's, oh, there's, there's somebody else in the chat's just saying, how is Project Search different to supported internships? It sounds interchangeable. Project Search, in my understanding, is, is it's a particular programme. Uh, is that right, Rachel? So it's yeah. a way of doing that. I mean, they are supported internships. And yes, you could set these up in a different way. What we wanted to illustrate to you was, was one way you can do that is project search. And it's not absolutely off the shelf, but it is a tried and tested methodology that is being used, as Rachel says, internationally. So, um, yes, you know, it, it is effectively a well-supported internship. So, yeah, if that helps, Ian. Um, yes. And uh, Catherine wanted to let you know that Blackpool Project Search looks wonderful. So oh, there you are. You. Unfortunately, <laughs> she's in Mansfield, so she can't send anybody to you. Um, but, you know, she, <laughs> she, she is letting us know that, you know, she's very impressed with what you've shared. So thank you ever so much. And thank, you. Gonna, thank, you, and, thank you. I'm going to hand over to Helen now to, to introduce uh, Jenny for us. Okay, hi. So, you know, after that really, really interesting section there, I'm sure you're all going to find this section here kind of really interesting also. So we have Jenny, Jenny Pemberton with us now from the Hollybank, Hollybank Trust, uh, and she is the lead um, clinical speech and language at the Trust. Now this, I'm sure she's going to tell you all about it herself, but this is a position, a, a provision, a specialist provision for children with profound disabilities. So there's children and young adults there, and it's also a residential care. So we'll hand it over to Jenny. Hello. Right. Okay. Hiya. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm the speech and language therapy clinical lead at Hollybank Trust. Um, and we're quite an unusual setting. Um, we support people of all the ages. They come to us from about two years old to nursery and they can stay with us for life if they want to. Um, so we go right through nursery and school into adulthood. Um, so we have the full range. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Brilliant. Um, so we have about 100 adult residents live with us and we also have a school um, that is attached to a children's home. So some of those schools are day students, some are residential with us um, and we have some daytime activity um, services for adults as well. Um, and at basically any stage in that um, the young people may stay and have respite or short breaks with us as well if they aren't already residents. Um, so it's a, a full unusual unusual um, package of, of care really um, and we support individuals with profound physical and learning difficulties um, so the majority of the people we're supporting are non-verbal wheelchair users lots of medical needs um, and one of our homes is actually a nursing home as well um, and lots of our young people also have multi-sensory impairments of vis vision and or hearing loss and um, other sensory needs as well um, and we're in the really lucky position of having an MDT on site so in addition to the teaching staff and care staff um, we also have um, speech physio and occupational therapy some assistive technology and some behaviour support and some nursing as well um, so we are in a very lucky position and these are some pictures of our, of our lovely young people um, so next slide please um, so 
talking about our our version of preparation for adulthood um we very much seen it was touched on earlier that from school entry we are preparing for adulthood um and it's going to look really different for everybody we're supporting um but there's quite a lot of common themes and actually listening to angela earlier most of these fit into those, those four broad areas of need that she was talking about. So right from the start of school, we're looking at somebody's social skills and interactions. How can they form relationships with peers and their, their carers and have those meaningful interactions and relationships? Um, how are they going to communicate? Um, you know, we've got many years if they're at the start of school, um, but ultimately adulthood, a lot of it is about giving their opinion and us knowing how somebody communicates and what they're trying to tell us. So we're working on that from very early on. Similarly, physical skills, we want to develop or maintain them if, if there are progressive conditions. So transfers, walking mobility, um, using their hands, all those sort of things. Autonomy and independence is massive if, if you are non-verbal and don't have great physical movement, how are you going to have that autonomy and independence over your life? And we're building that in from really, really early on, um, sort of quite informally through play. And then as they grow older, it becomes more um, a, a formal decision and choice making if they're able. We're of course looking at somebody's health throughout the life. And hopefully if, if we have them early from, from school age, we'll know by adulthood what their health needs are going to be in an ongoing manner. Um, are they improving health? Are they, uh, is their health deteriorating? What are the signs that they might have health difficulties and we need to act early? So we're just getting to know someone really well through that. Occupational engagement, what entertains them? What grasps their attention through the day? What might they, might they be interested on in later on in life? And of course that changes, but we're starting to get that picture of what really engages a person, or what keeps them busy. Um, Managing varied sensory environments and places. And I'm going to bring in behaviour support there as well. Um, so some of that is physically managing sort of a daily routine, getting up, getting dressed, managing the kitchen for a lunch. Um, some of it is access to shared areas. So things like the school hall can be really challenging if, if there's visual impairment or hearing loss or, or sensory needs going on as well. Um, but also later in life, accessing shared environments and that might be specialist settings like colleges or it might be going to your local bowling or your local theatre, going shopping. And actually, do you have the support in place to manage that? So it might be sort of desensitising someone and getting them used to a, a busy and noisy environment. Or maybe it's what sort of sensory equipment might they need to be able to manage these places. So things like um, you know, weighted equipment or earphones and things, when when are those sort of things useful to help somebody manage the different environments that you encounter to have a fulfilled life, really? And it can take the full amount of childhood to fully figure those out because the people we're supporting are really complex and remembering that largely the non-verbal and can't tell us either. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so then if we're looking a little bit more specifically, so all that stuff is the stuff we're doing anyway, and we maybe wouldn't call it preparation for adulthood, but it is. Um, if we start looking more specifically at the skills that we're going to need for adulthood and that transition to adulthood, um, we start a communication passport, go to somebody throughout school um, and, and throughout their time with us at Hollybank. Um, I know some places they sort of wait until the transition is coming up to be putting that information together, but we we have to accept that our young people have usually a huge number of carers and, and teachers and staff and people involved in their lives and everybody needs to know that. Everybody can contribute to that and get it up to date and really, really detailed by the time they have to have a transition. So we don't wait, that goes with them through life. We're working really early on from choice making. And again, that starts from very, very young with, with toys and, and games. And then we might become a little bit more formal using symbols, offering objects, making choices about activities in, in their school or the daily routines. Um, we're quite proactive in using the language that they're going to need to use when we are preparing for adulthood. So there's no point going through school never using the language about feelings and opinions. I want, I think, I feel worried, I feel anxious, I'm happy. If we don't use all those words, those symbols, the signs, the body signs early on, when we suddenly ask somebody to try and articulate that to us, be it verbally or non-verbally, they're not going to know that language. So we need to really proactively build that in early on. 
Um, and we, we give our young people quite a lot of involvement in decisions and around their life as a, as a um, child and giving feedback on what they think. Um, so we might do that sort of informally or we might do a bit more formally using systems like talking maps where you're sorting symbols into sort of good and bad and I like it, I don't like it, things like that. Um, we then start thinking possibly as they're getting older, if they're a day student with us, um, bringing in some respite um, as they're getting older to, to start to understand what their overnight needs might be, to get them a bit used to not always being at home with mum and dad maybe because some children can get to 16 or, or more and they've never spent a night away from mum and dad. So it can then be really difficult for them to adjust to that. Um, and right from the start, we're getting our children's input into review. So again, they're used to giving that opinion and their opinion being important in a, in a more formal setting. So how's school going for them? What do they like at school? What do they like in, in our residential home? What would they like to change? So we're quite proactively building those things in from early on. Next slide. Um, and then when we get to post 16, we're becoming a little bit more formal. Um, so we actually proactively start to think about what is this transition going to look like? Um, so it sounds quite early if we're looking at a school leaver at 18. Um, and um, if somebody's leaving school at 18 or, or 19, they get an extra year. Um, we go, it sounds a long time, but actually three years goes by really quickly. Um, so we begin an extra review when they get to 16, an extra review every year where we're specifically discussing what their placement is going to look like as an adult. Um, are they interested? So we aren't a college for post 18, 19. We don't provide the education. So if it looks like they are going to access further education and their EHCP is going to continue, um, we need to be starting looking at those colleges and what they're interested in. Do they want to access our day centre if they stay with us and live with us as an adult? Do they want to access our, our daytime support in that way? Or is there another local day centre that they're interested in going to as well? Um, are they going to go into a care setting, be that ours, that is full time, fully supported care setting? Or do they just need some, some part time or some, some supported living? So I start to think really early on about what they're going to do. Um, and it's not necessarily um, work opportunities, it's not necessarily further education, but it's still preparing for adulthood. Um, we have had some of our some of our older adults now have had some work opportunities. Um, we've had some in house because we've got, like I said, the full MDT. We've also got full staff of of, of admin, HR, finance, cleaning. So we've ha we've catering. So we've had some people having some work experiences in house like that, um, and we've actually had some people externally. Um, so I think they've been like front of house at Next and Body Shop. We've had somebody doing some voluntary work in a bank. So it doesn't necessarily have to be paid work if that's not what they want or they want to do it for a short amount of time. The really key thing is that whatever that daytime is going to look like, be it work or a day centre or a college or, a care, or in the care setting, what are meaningful opportunities for that person? And meaningful might be that they are engaged in their daily routine, that they do some of the household jobs. Um, but there has to be something meaningful for everybody there, even if it's not work or education. Next slide. Okay. Um, this, this slide makes me a bit sad. Um, much as we all want to be person centred and caring and provide that person with what they want, we need to think about funding at this point. Um, so I think Rachel touched on the fact that there are funding criteria, the specifications for that service, and lots of services have that. They might require specific criteria for entry, like lots of colleges do. Um, or for example, they might need a really high level of funding. So, so our um, older adults who have had those work opportunities in, in a bank or in Next and things have needed one-to-one -one support from us to do that. And if we just know that they aren't going to have enough one-to-one -one support, we don't want to be offering things that aren't going to be possible. Or if we offer them, we need to be thinking, well, where are we going to get the funding to support this? Um, so unfortunately, we need to think about funding right from that 16 as well. And there's structures in place to start talking about what funding somebody will get as an adult as well in those reviews. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so I've just mentioned about being person-centred. We all know we should be person-centred. Um, so, 
as a speech therapist, I'm off, <laughs> obviously really, really key to me is getting that person's opinion. And, and it's got to be their own opinion. Um, so sometimes we've got people that can give quite a, a formal opinion. They can access easy read information with symbols or social stories. Um, they can use symbols and give yes, no answers, make a talking map, which is like a visual representation of things that are important to that person. They might use multimedia, so doing some videos or something like that. Um, they may need a bit less, less of a formal opportunity to give an opinion, but they might need a, a real life experience before they can understand um, the concept of a change or being an adult. And, and they might need to see a new house or a new setting that they're going to before they can give that that feedback or we might take them to that real setting and judge their responses um, or we might do what we call circles of support so the team around that child will discuss what we think works well what they like what they don't like um, and come up with a plan between us so that person might be able to explicitly say what's important to them what they want what they don't want or or just indicate what things are important by by us knowing what they like in life and what they don't um, as a speech therapist, I am often contacted by a transition social worker when they start to get involved soon after 16. Um, so that, that transition social worker has the communication support to um, actually get real answers out of that young person. So it's not just a tick box exercise of, of filling in the form. We, we want those real answers from somebody. somebody. So that works really well um, when myself and the social worker work together to do that job. Next slide, please. Um, so, I can't read the top of that slide. Does it still say post-16? Um, or it might say person-centred. Never mind. Um, <laughs> so, we're largely aiming for different goals. We're not largely aiming at Holly Bank for college, work, independent, living or travel. Um, but we are still aiming for the things that are important to that person. Um, for and to that person. So that's some of the sort of phrasing from the EHCP. And just because that's coming to an end, it doesn't mean we can't take the information from that. Um, even though we're not aiming for work or college or independent living or travel, we still want that person to develop their skills. And largely that is by having some autonomy over their life. There might be physical skills and things in there as well. I'm a speech therapist. I'm more interested in the autonomy and the communication. Um, so actually, can they still develop the communication further? And often they can. Often the teenage, late teen, early 20 is a really good time for developing that autonomy and communication because attention improves, difficulties of behaviour are often sorted by that point. Um, that want to communicate is often, often really strong at that point. So it's often a really good time to work on that, actually. Um, we've got an assistive technology team, so we look a lot at environmental control technology. So can this person have a switch to open their own bedroom door, to open their own curtains, to turn the TV on? We often link that with communication. So if they've got communication aids, often the communication aids can become an alarm call um, or they can change the tele channel, turn a light on. And just because, just because those bits of equipment don't lead to independent living doesn't mean they're not valuable. If somebody can just turn, press a button to turn their own hairdryer on every morning, that is a massive advantage to some people. And it doesn't mean they're living independently, but it doesn't mean it's not worth doing. Um, I've mentioned a lot about what's their daytime occupation going to be, where they're going to still develop their physical skills and maintain the things they've learned in school, because I think they are very easily lost when that massive package of familiar support comes to an end. Um, Another note, a little bit about funding here is not to under, underestimate one, the value of this, but also the amount of time for staff training, staff support, funding and therapy support to do these things. They're not like a two hour session. You put that bit of equipment in place and you can leave. You need to give regular practice, regular support, regular maintenance. There's a massive turnover in the care sector. You need to train those staff again and again and again and give them support to do that. And it's very easy to think, yeah, great, we'll, we'll put this bit of equipment or this system in place and leave it. And you can't, you need to build into future packages how to support that potentially for life. Next slide. Ah, this bit, this, this bit is about preparing the team around that child. Um, so in, in some cases, um, the transition for the child might they, they might not be able to understand what's going to happen as they become an adult, as they leave school, as they potentially move home. 
Um, so often it is the team around that individual that, that need to be much better prepared. Um, sometimes services need to continue and as they transition from a child service to an adult service, they still need that specialism, but the person is changing. Um, so really we need to plan ahead so that that is, is seamless and especially with complex health and care needs, that seamless transition between services is really important. Um, lots of our young people, I've talked about some of our, our more able young people who can give their opinion, can go and do a bit of work, some, some meaningful activity in the daily routine. Some of our young people really don't have an understanding or an awareness of, of what is happening or what has happened. And if, do you know what, if they're at that level and we have made that transition as so smooth it is unnoticeable to them. Do you know what? We've prepared really well for their adulthood, even though they might not have needed to do anything. Um, I've talked about preparing for ample of daytime um, support, replicating routines for those who really struggle with a change of routine. They might change a place, but keep that routine the same so that they have that bit of understanding still going on. And having a backup or flexible plan because you can plan the best you want and something goes wrong somebody's poorly and can't support that transition on the day or a plan placement falls through so don't rely on just one plan have a, a few just in cases next slide please and then i've talked a lot about building up to this point the transition the actual transition between childhood and adulthood um, and generally, I think the general consensus is we, we assume and we aim for slow and steady is the best option. Gradual visits, building them up, building up time, building up maybe a, a dinner time, an overnight stay. Um, but hopefully we've got to know our young people really, really well. Um, and sometimes you start that and it becomes apparent that that is not the best way for them because they're confused. They don't know where they're going when it, it's backwards and forwards. And you know what? We just go for it. And we know that this week might be a really difficult week, but we'll get through that and they'll settle much more quickly. So it's about being flexible and individual and knowing your young person. We try and again, because we have that school and residential on site, we're really lucky. We really try not to at the end of the 19th academic year, school ends and they move home all at once. Um, coming back to communication, a, a lot of our, our young people don't have great understanding of what we've told them is going to happen and they are non-verbal and don't have great communication. So if something's going wrong, they really need somebody familiar to either pick up on that through their non-verbal cues or to be able to communicate with them about it. And if suddenly everybody in every setting has changed, they lose that. So we try and move to their long-term adult setting at the end of 18 when, when the funding changes. Um, and then when they've still got that year with familiar people in school and then school finishes and they are already in a familiar adult setting. So if we can do it that way around it's best, sometimes it goes the other way. Um, and it means that we can spot problems much, much more quickly and that young person is much more settled. Um, we, we constantly review it. Um, we, we have those extra extra meetings every six months from, from 16 and talk about how it's going. Um, and we change the plan if, if we need to change the plan because we need to be person-centered and not just crack on if something's not going very well. Um, I've mentioned that some of that support you're putting in place might need to be forever. Adulthood's a really long time. Um, but also accepting that, do you know what, people change, they change what they wanted and what worked well for them, potentially at 18 or 19. Um, so they might want some variety later. Or do you know what, it's fine if they don't, if they're fine, variety doesn't have to be the spice of life. They might stay as they are for their adult life and be fine and happy and engaged as long as they are. We don't necessarily need to have a change. Um, so I think that was everything. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions if, if I need to. Thank you so much for that, Jenny. And I think that really contextualised what we've been talking about and, you know, really built on some of the things we've said in the earlier sessions. 
and you know those universal truths really that actually it is about people having good lives and you know sort of whatever your starting point you still want to have the best life possible um so that that was really powerful in in what you've said and i just love the point that you made that you know whilst we might not be able to make everyone independent everybody can have some degree of independence and that's really important isn't it and 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 if we can focus on that it's a really good thing so i've got a question from zoe um, Zoe Evans, she was asking, she said she, she, she was really delighted to see, um, it was excellent to see ex realistic expectations uh, and just wanted to know, are you ever challenged to prove individuals are still making progress towards autonomy from LAs and funders? Uh, yes. Um, yes, we are. It, it depends. So we, we take young people from all over the country, from young people and some old people now from, from all over the country. Um, and it, it depends on the authority really and how they review it or not. But yes, they definitely, they want to see um, usually evidence towards sort of person-centered goals. Um, it b becomes much more tricky. We've got quite a lot of people with progressive conditions and then they still ask to see for progress. And we, we need to explain that actually, do you know what? Maintenance is great. We're really happy with maintenance. Um, but yes, they do. And often um, we, we do a daily log of what everyone's doing. Um, and it often does then come back to, the, to therapy, actually to say, right, what are your therapy aims? How's this person met them? Um, and we often send sort of pictures and, and videos to be able to do that. Um, but it's less formal generally than, than an EHCP, so the less sort of tied down they will achieve this. Um, we, it's more about scrubbery targets and, and again what that individual wants to do. So it might not be necessarily progress or a new skill, but more about an activity they want to do, an activity they want to try. Does that answer the question yeah well Zoe's just just sort of come back in the chat and just said it's those who are maintaining or and or deteriorating um that tend to challenge funders and and certainly from our experience in specialist I would absolutely <laughs> concur with that and yet they are often you know the learners and the young people who need the most in terms of specialist support um, so, you know, I think I think all we can really do is keep banging that drum, Zoe, and sort of supporting each other and keep sort of challenging everybody who'll listen um, and say, actually, you know, maintenance for me, for some learners is absolutely massive progress and even, you know, some deterioration, but not as much as there would have been if we hadn't had the support in place. Mm -hmm actually can be a positive outcome for somebody can't it you know i mean that's the reality of these types of learners with incredibly complex needs it's it's really hard to prove the bit about what might have happened if we weren't here um so a lot of it we we um we sometimes we've used like well-being scales to look at a person's sort of emotional well-being instead if if their health needs are unfortunately deteriorating, we look, but actually how are they emotionally? How is their daily activities and, and their general involvement in, in life? And we also have used, um, well, I'm a therapist, we use TOMS, which is the therapy outcome measure system quite a lot, but we've also, there's um, a, a sort of outcome measure called GAS, which is goal attainment system scheme, something like that. And it basically gives a score from naught and you can go up to one or two and down to minus one or minus two and not is expected level. So do you know what, if they haven't deteriorated as far as you think, then they've got a plus one. <laughs> um, so that's quite a nice way of looking at it rather than necessarily gaining skills. And, and Zoe's just sharing that, that one of the positive impacts of COVID, and we all wanted to hear positive impacts of COVID, um, is that that has actually given us a period where we've got some evidence of you know the the fact that in lockdown when people weren't able to access some of the full-time specialist services and support they might otherwise yeah. have had we did see more of a deterioration so you know actually being able to sort of capture and and sort of share that as as outcome data you know not positive outcome data but outcome data will help us sort of defend some of these services that we have in place so that's a really good point Zoe I like that uh, we'll be <laughs> recommending that everybody sort of interrogates their lockdown data and so that we can protect some of these vital services. Uh, Jenny, I can't thank you enough. That's really helpful. And, and I know that we had at least one person on the call who was asking for um, specialist, more specialist information around PFA. So if, um, 
if you know if they want to come back to us and just say whether there are any further questions they've got or whether you feel you know sort of Jenny's answered your questions then then do let us know about that um we've we've got I think by my clock we're on um 521 just moved to 522 am I am I on the same Greenwich mean time as everybody else um, just nod if you think I'm about right, which gives us about eight minutes. So I will try and keep an eye on the chat whilst I'm doing it, but I'm just going to wrap up this final session and pull it together um, as we sort of uh, move on. So if we could have the next slide, please. So what um, we're hoping that you can do on the back of this session is actually sort of extend your PFA audit. So as we've gone through the three sessions, we've identified under those headings of employment, health, community relationships and friends and independence, things that you might put into your universal offer. And we tried to sort of sort of exemplify that really from early years right the way through to post 16 things that you might put into your targeted offer and things that you might put into your specialist. And so what we're hoping is that you can actually create for your setting and everybody's will be quite unique, your own sort of PFA audit of what are you doing now already? And then hopefully add in some of the things that you've heard over the three sessions that you think would strengthen your offer and you know would, would make it a bit more robust. Um, and, and those links and signposts to other organizations who've got useful information that you know you would like to use now in the chat um we had a lovely idea well i think it's a lovely idea um which was um from uh let me just see if i can find it now I wonder if one of my colleagues can find it quickly for me. Um, oh, it's from Samantha, um, who was saying that, will we be putting together a toolkit from the content of the four training sessions? To be absolutely honest, it was never um, something that we had sort of suggested we would do, but I quite like the idea. So it would be useful if anyone thinks that would be helpful. If you want to pop something in the chat to say, you know, yes, a toolkit would be useful that would give us a sense of whether or not that's a piece of sort of work we could do because we we still have networking time as a region so whilst we've I think used the pull of our CPD time this was our final session for this year tonight um, we could still sort of you know pull together a, a document that would hopefully support you and meet your needs so if you think a toolkit <laughs> I can see now the chat is saying <laughs> a toolkit would be uh, really useful um, okay so it won't be a fully comprehensive toolkit but it will collect together the things that we've shared in the sessions um, for you and then you can hopefully map them across into your offer okay um, and we will we will commission Jenny to do a little bit of work for us around that special stuff because there was some great stuff in there that was really really good really appreciate your support with that okay so I'm now on 525 which leaves us with five minutes has anybody got any questions they would like to put to us um, I think we've got just uh, another slide oh sorry <laughs> I think there was just at the end of the slides, there were a couple of resources, including a document that uh, in my my travels, uh, I located here, which is the Send Gatsby Benchmark Toolkit. I'm constantly looking for new resources we can put into the hands of people. And this seems to be one that I've not sort of been had my attention drawn to before. So in the slide uh, pack, you'll get you'll get the PowerPoint from the slides. Uh, you've got a link in there and hopefully that might be something you can have a little look at, uh, which has been produced by Base UK.